Uh, we're eight writers from the Nonfiction Lab, and I'll just introduce everyone. We're standing in random order around the room. Uh, Bonnie Cassidy, Gretchen Coombs, Melody Ellis, Else Fitzgerald, Smiliana Glisfitch, Lonnie Jeffs, Peter Murray, and myself, Lucinda Strawn. Today we're addressing the question, how do we write about jewellery? There's no one way to write about jewellery and this workshop will be a demonstration of that. Each of us will offer our own response to Lisa Walker's work and then we'll invite you to consider different approaches to writing jewellery using the prompts um, that we've provided on the sheet that you've got on your stool. Our workshop involves three parts. First, you'll hear our individual responses to the show, which will all be really varied um, and probably not what you would expect writers to do when we write about jewellery. I, I don't know, maybe. Um, so first we'll do that. The, the, what we're doing today are not developed pieces, but they're early sparks of ideas triggered by this show. Um, and we've brought these as a kind of a process showing of our um, writing in process. After this, um, there will be 10 quiet minutes after this in which you're invited to be in the space and to consider the prompts that we've given you, a little bit of quiet time to consider how you might use this for your own writing approaches to the show, uh, an an uh, opportunity for you to just consider perhaps different ways of approaching writing about jewellery. So that will be 10 minutes for you. And during that time, the stools will be moved and you're encouraged to move around the space. And uh, after that, we'll gather down the end of the gallery around the triangle for a discussion uh, about how do we write about jewellery. So each writer will now speak from the spot where we are. And uh, it doesn't matter if you can't see people. Um, some people are hidden in the wedge over there. but. Um, it doesn't matter, it just uh, as long as you can hear us. And um, yeah, hope you enjoy it. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Lucinda. Hi, my name is Melody. How would I write about jewellery? I write onto a blank sheet of paper. I Google jewellery and don't find what I'm looking for. So I look up Marilyn Monroe and Coco Chanel. Diamonds are a girl's best friend, sang Marilyn. When I Google men and jewellery, I get how much jewellery is too much for a man, as if jewellery is al always already feminine. I'm stating the obvious, I know. Perhaps this has something to do with why there isn't as much critical writing on jewellery as there is on sculpture, which is to say that there hasn't been a tradition of writing on jewellery, which is to say that jewellery continues to occupy the space of a craft or a trade rather than a discipline which is to say that I cannot think of one theorist off the top of my head known for their writing on jewellery. First year of art school, 9am lecture, our art history teacher puts up a slide of traditional binaries. Art and craft are at the top. Art on one side, along with masculine, positive, rational, sane, etc. Craft on the other, along with feminine, negative, irrational, mad, etc. This is Art History 101. You already know what I'm talking about. You already know what I'm talking about so well that I wonder whether or not it's worth saying. And yet, it strikes me, particularly here in this room, surrounded by Lisa Walker's extraordinary jewellery objects, that irrational and mad are some of the best adjectives for these works. Irreverent, oddball, playful. I want to say conceptual, and yet, I don't want to do so in order to suggest that in, quote, elevating it to the conceptual, I'm somehow falling into the age-old binaries of conceptual equals fine art equals better than craft. And yet, clearly, the conceptual is an important aspect of this work, which I wouldn't want to deny. Ah, the bind of the binaries. I decide, as a thought experiment at least, that I will resist calling these objects anything other than jewellery, because why do they need a qualifier like conceptual anyway? As well as Marilyn Monroe and Coco Chanel, I look up Dorothy Parker, just in case she said something funny about jewellery. I don't find anything specific, but she did once quip, don't look at me in that tone of voice. 
This imperative strikes me as a useful way of thinking about Lisa Walker's work. It highlights the riddle, the poetic, the comic, and the absurd. It also underscores both Parker and Walker's dexterous ability to flip things around and play with meaning. And of course, in, Le in Lisa's case, with materiality also. It seems to me that in thinking about how to write about jewellery, we find ourselves necessarily thinking about materiality, the body, gender, performance, the decorative, adornment, and value, to name just a few key terms. And indeed, as with any writing, we will all bring to writing about jewellery a different vocabulary or set of preoccupations. Thank you. Hi, I'm Gretchen, and I am just going to do a couple little readings for you. First, I'm responding to the shapes of this, of Lisa Walker's exhibit, or actually the exhibition itself. The round cry of round bean makes the sky round like a cupola, and in this rounded landscape, everything seems to be in repose. The round bean propagates its roundness together with the calm of all roundness. That's Gaston Bachelard from the phenomenology of roundness in the poetics of space. So I've written a haiku roundup just to respond to that. Veer left with one eye, sculpt the side to a curve, cool texture awaits. Joni says seasons, they go round and round, Falling acorns hit the ground. Veer right with one foot. Follow the bend with your will. Straight lines lost in space. Never search, always quest. Center brings a lonely shadow. Stars failing to rest. Ring around my neck. Hold close, my love, too tender. Eyes to each pillow. My name is Peter. I know nothing about jewellery, but I know what I like. All I have to display for you today is a gesture towards a work of vulgar assemblage via an object lesson in vestimentary semiotics. Repeat, vestimentary semiotics. Is it an amulet? An object worn around the neck or on the arm or the leg in the form of a pendant is the most common and believed to possess magical or spiritual power to protect the wearer from danger or dispel evil influences. My friend Maureen bought this amulet for the princely sum of $7 in an op shop in Geelong on the 20th of the 5th, 2017. The design was striking and the workmanship was excellent. Is it a talisman, an object believed to possess supernatural traits meant to confer special benefits or powers? upon the wearer. When she searched her archives for a talisman to make my pendant to give me for my birthday, she was looking for bright colours and this one jumped out. So fitting and a bluebird of happiness, she writes, adding, I had recently been to the NGV Triennial, I believe. The choice of the black and white webbing which came through industrial waste, sourced through reverse art truck, of which I am a member, seemed perfect. Is it a locket? An object that opens to reveal a space which serves to hold a smaller object, usually a photograph or a curl of hair, but in this case, Salt by Peter Murray. <laughs> Even the beloved tomato 
regarded by some as a powerful aphrodisiac, feared by others as chill to the stomach, a suspected cause of gout, cancer, polio. Is it any wonder that tomatoes were, for a long time after their arrival in Europe, cultivated chiefly as an ornamental curiosity and occasional insecticide? Yet we now know that as well as being preventative against certain cancers, tomatoes may help to preserve mental and physical functioning among the elderly. Is it a medallion, most often a coin-shaped piece of metal worn as a pendant around the neck or pinned onto clothing granted as awards, recognitions or religious blessings? The black fabric is a dead stock fabric, end of roll or excess, sourced in Melbourne from a company, Textile Mania, that supplies interior designers and architect customers. It's a European fabric, vinyl, designed for the hospitality market, upholstery and bars, clubs, whatever. And the green lining fabric is also from the same supplier, 100% polyester. By the way, two litre sized ice cream tubs, on the other hand, may be purchased online from right price distributors of 12 Precision Drive, Molendar, Queensland, 4214. You may buy them in bulk in bags containing 216 tubs at the discounted price of 61 cents per unit. Mais, cependant, this pendant, ce, this pendant, Hanging. Cependant, my French is poor, my accent is worse, yet some of you may recognize my attempt to say the French word, cependant. Let's say it together. Cependant. Cependant. It means however, and my non-fiction takes place in a material practice of performative however, worn for you as vestimentary semiotics in the defiance of old age. Thank you. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Else Fitzgerald. Um, I'm a fiction writer and I mostly at the moment work in a speculative fiction space, um, thinking a lot about climate change and imagining different kinds of futures, and what kinds of world might emerge from the Anthropocene. Um, I think a lot about waste and my contribution to it. Somebody said to me once, everything you've ever owned still exists somewhere. And this to me is pretty staggering. Um, particularly when you think about how much you've accumulated and also left behind in your life. The Bureau of Suspended Objects, which I've offered as a kind of text for you today, uh, details how nothing that has been discarded ever truly goes away. Um, the thing I found most interesting about Lisa's work and what I've used as a way into thinking about how to write something from this show um, is her use of unusual materials to make jewellery, uh, found objects, pieces of plastic, things which might be technically considered to be trash or waste. Uh, and turning these into ob an object of value. Um, this is how I've begun to explore this question of how I might write about jewellery. I can remember pieces of jewellery throughout my life which might have been precious even if only to me, but many of these items are now lost. I still have my great-grandmother's ring, but my watch broke recently and it was cheaper to buy a new one than to fix the old one. The watch had been a gift. Will the new watch, an exact copy, hold any of the same significance? What do I do with the old, broken watch? What kind of world will these objects last into? Through thinking about Lisa's work, I've begun work on a short story set in a future Melbourne where the main character, who lives in a slum of climate refugees in a now flooded city, dives for lost objects. Her mother makes a living through knitting old plastic into plan and turning it into fishing net, carry bags, jewellery. Thank you. My name's Bonnie Cassidy. This is a poem. It's called Bother. 
bother to do fleecy slackness like an oversized exhibition title, this flopped hug. To wash volcano pebbles and emblems, Otero's charms, this amulet greenstone, Old Testament valleys, suburban offender, Koru. It's all in, this unwanted brought back into want. To uncool as beauty, say thoughts sharp but free of hurt. Make soft things stronger. Wearing tenderness as armour. This clamshell, this midden, the many definitions of batter, of safety pin. To know not everything is precious. Value is not subjective. You could not have made this. This finitude that language does not suffer. I almost need to map this out. In one corner, there is Duchamp. Somewhere near him lies a urinal. Somewhere else, another corner, perhaps. There is Walker and the collection of ornaments, adornments, which combine to form the meat of this retrospective. Floating around the Duchamp end of the spectrum, there is the word art. On the Walker side, we have the word jewelry. I'll turn to César Ara on contemporary art. Consider the following passage. We would need to speak of expanded reproduction, though not expanded along the line of technical improvements, but rather expanded in all directions, or better still, in all dimensions. And that would be literature, literature as expanded reproduction in all directions. This is a direction of writing about jewelry, as it is the direction of writing about art. The motion is outward. Language is important here. Do we really need language to describe or denote art? Probably not. Somewhere along the way, the auction houses realize we really need language to sell it. From Adrian Rich, the ornament hung from my neck is a black locket with a chain barely felt for years, clasp I couldn't open. So close the relationship to the ornament is the reality of a body having to wear it, hold it. Consider the French verb porter. It's not that you wear jewelry, but that you carry it. Public ornament, private fictions. I am finding that you can't talk about jewelry without recognizing that it lives so close to the body. We use mannequins as placeholders, busts, a trial site. When that hair tie is simply too new to live around a wrist, and so for a time it becomes a ring, and eventually a bracelet, then lost or broken. Back to Aira. Literature, or literature as I understand and practice it, could be the silver bridge hung between the done and the not done, which established between themselves a mysterious and suggestive asymmetry. Somewhere between the maker, jewelry, viewer, writer, writing, reader, or body, object, body, body, process, body. These works, the jewelry and the writing, move between three states, that of body, that of object, and that of process. Between some body and object, writing must form the silver bridge. I'll repeat, public ornament, private fictions. Uh, I um, often write autoethnographically, and um, the prompt that I've provided for you on the list is an autoethnographic prompt, but um, looking at some of the other prompts, um, there's one which is write a list, and lists are another way that I really love to write, and they've, there's a history of lists as um, essay practice, and I think, for instance, um, Bart was a really big list writer, you know, not, uh, I mean, as a literary form. 
This is a list of all things that jewellery is or can be by Aki Rose Barrett, age 14, Jack Strawn, aged 8, and Auntie Lucy with interjections from Albie Nash Barrett, age 5. A strangulation device. A dagger. Something a murderer can use to poison someone through their skin. A choking hazard. A risk to toddlers. A ring with a nose on it. Opal, topaz, peridot, aquamarine. It can represent my birthday. It can show your mood. It can be lost on the beach. It can be broken. It can be swallowed, stolen, cursed. And all the girls always wear all their rings in the summer. It can be a promise, a contract, cheap, expensive. It looks like sheep. An heirloom, a gift, a symbol, an art, chopsticks with jade lines on the ends. I think anything precious can be jewellery. A turkey. This is not a dance routine. This is not a dancer's body. This body only desires to know that object. This is not a performance. This is a process. This is a process in finding language. My name is Milena Glishovic. To give the name jewellery to a certain object is to set up a desire. The desire belongs to the body that wishes to adorn itself with this thing, to display the thing on the body. In the displaying and adorning, the two bodies are transforming. They move differently in the world now that they move together. Carrying, being carried, sharing bodies, noticing weights, textures against skin, against metal, against fabrics that chafe together in this new kind of movement through the world together. But this desire is denied once you call the object jewellery and pin it to a wall in this kind of context. So my way into this was through Bath, who talks about the pleasure of the text existing in the gape the promise of fulfilment, not the fulfilment itself. I wanted to explore this deferral of desire that my body cannot know these objects through actual contact. You can't enact what's being set up. These objects are in pause, petrified. My experiment was to explore the body's desire for the object through embodiment and through a kind of speculative movement. What would it be like to adorn and display this on my body? From this place of embodiment, I moved toward language. And the following are my first notes um, after that process that set out for you there. So my own um, stream of consciousness writing. I found the softness trying to be hard, trying to find roundness in the straightness, finding curves whilst being dead straight little hats, little floppy hats and straight hats and all the heads huddled together. I found the double movement from above and below. I found edges and a rhythm, a rhythm that wants to kink, wants to show you the kink whilst also a dangle, a sway of a dangle, but making the kick, the kink, the kick visible to you. Hanging, finding a long limb and space around its limbs, the air between the, li the limbs, hanging, dangling, but also a huddling, stitched at the head and dangling the long limbs. I found the point, the point reaching around, moving around and to the point, down and up, a downward and an upward movement, suspended and held, hanging, slow, small small, careful movements, because I don't want to really undo the myth. I don't want you to see the softness, not entirely. It is so soft. I want to play out this game. Don't touch, don't lift the hands to it. I feel into the stuffing, the stuffing and puffing out, the bulging, and it has to bulge if it is also to find its point. 
The charm is in the wink where we all know we're all pretending. The setup, the appearance only of weight, texture, temperature. It's a lie exposed and affirmed. We want to play. My body in its movement wants to support this lie. The pleasure is in our awareness of the conceit. We support it. We try to be with this doubleness. Thanks, everyone. Thanks to my colleagues for those great readings. And now please take 10 minutes to consider the prompts and just to be in the gallery. actually really interested in what your um, responses are to that because this was very experimental for us <laughs> and so we're really curious about um, what that was like for you, how you experienced the prompt that you chose and also if you have any questions for any, any one of us um, about the kind of um, method that we offered up um, for a way into writing about any of these objects. Um, so we've got a microphone I think um, coming around if anyone would like to share or if someone would like to share their writing that would be so beautiful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, oh, hi. Um, I was just looking at the prompt for um, thinking about jewellery and where it will be in 50 years. Um, and it's something that I think all of us think about, about if we're making stuff and the things that we create, where it will end up and especially environmentally um, if it's worth making sometimes and if somebody's going to buy it, what will happen to it? And yeah, that's sort of what I was thinking about. Um, so I just wrote um, in 50 years, 2069, um, and the piece of jewellery that I wrote about was a ring that I've made that I'm wearing. Um, uh, it's a memento of when I first started creating and believing I could create something. Something of worth to myself and hopefully to others too. Will I still have it? I think so. Sentimentality clouds my ability to throw away. Maybe I gave it to someone as a memento of myself. Thank you. Thanks. Um, this is vague for me, maybe someone else can fill it in, but I heard a snippet um, in one of the videos where people discussed um, how particular pieces um, are kind of historical artefacts, and so it was kind of um, important to preserve them. I didn't hear the whole panel, so I don't know if anyone wants to um, share that, or it might be interesting to see the previous panel. Mm. Would anyone else like to share anything? Or I wonder if anyone came up with a prompt of their own, an addition to the list of prompts. Hang on, I'll just wait for a mic. 
Thank you. Um, instruction five, you, the first one was a specific time and place. The second one was a relationship to the object or work. It causes you to think about. And the third one was a text. I translated those into the first one being sight, as in what's your resonance with a sight that it reminds you of. And the second one I translated as what sort of psychic response are you getting when you look at the piece? And the third one was the um, text, the text one, the, the film or book. I translated that as what semantic field are you working in when you're looking at it? And what did, you, what did you come up with? I haven't got there yet. Okay. <laughs> but I just translated it because I was thinking those specific prompts are very sort of general and how do they arrive in me and that's how they arrived in me and from there from there i could begin to work oh, nice. with them mm -hmm. great yeah thank you would anyone else like to just share their how they went with the prompts or I went with the um, prompt three um, to kind of talk about the maker's, the maker's method and um, rather than the resulting object and how language can kind of be used to translate that. Um, I think with uh, Lisa Walker's work, the... Yeah, OK. <laughs> um, the materials and the, the found objects, they're so rich with association that I often find it a bit overwhelming. Um, so what I go to and maybe a lot of other makers go to is looking at the method of making literally the, the you know, combining of materials, the attachments, that kind of thing. And I think what um, she does really well is make that really deliberate, you know, the, the folds sure. and the connections the glue, that kind of thing. So in, in order, for, you know, the way I translate that into language is imagining it as a series of onomatopoeia. So, you know, crack, squelch, ping, scrape, that kind of thing. And to kind of al almost imagine the studio landscape as like a comic strip <laughs> scenario. <laughs> Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, given that it sounds like you're a maker. Yeah. Um, why um, is language important? Like, what does language allow you, given that you're working with those materials? Why do you have an interest in um, finding a language around your practice? Good question. Uh, why is it important? Um, I think to contextualise it um, and to kind of place it... Um, within, yeah, we'll place it within a context of making or I think with Lisa's work, it's, there's, there's so many other contexts that you can read her work through. Um, yeah, I don't know if that's an answer, but... <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I, um, that just made me think of a metaphor that um, is kind of a bit of writing one-on-one and I'm sure we'll all be familiar with this, that um, idea that when you're writing a piece, you often have the beads and you need to look for the thread, you know? And I love that, it just made me think of that there, your idea about um, language, like onomatopoeic words, kind of becoming like, um, you know, little beads or like, you know, little objects. So that kind of material, that, you know, the language being material and having a series of these really uh, sensory kind of words connected together like a yeah like like that that thing that we always talk about as a necklace like there's lots of really great um, ideas there that's yeah mm. <laughs> uh, first of all I just wanted to thank you all for these prompts I found them all really inspiring and um, I'm a maker and I can see that, you know, just having a kind of 
a crack at doing these as an exercise can inspire me into kind of new ways of thinking about what I'm doing. So thank you all for that. Um, I'll have a read of what I wrote. <laughs> so I chose to... Oh, well, I was sort of inspired by prompt number two. Where's this piece going to be in 50 years' time? And it's the piece I'm wearing around my neck now, um, which I made last year for an exhibition I did that was about um, Melbourne's industrial suburbs and how they're changing. And so the piece represents a sawtooth roof of the old ICI glass factory in Newport. I'll read my piece. These sawtooth roofs, peaks lapped by impinging waves, rusty corrugated waves amongst the surf, was was the place of glass making molten sand transformed to bottles, now being ground down by wave action back to sand, the cycle of entropy. Okay. Thank you. Um, I was quite interested, Lucinda, in how your conversation with your nieces and nephews, um, you know, talking to children about jewellery who don't maybe necessarily bring as many of the same preconceived ideas that we might bring when we think about what jewellery is and whether there was anything, like, surprising or... Kind of, I mean, some of the things that you read out were hilarious. All the yeah, murder, I think, kind of, yeah. all the murder yeah, references. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the strangulation. <laughs> that was the first thing that came up. The strangulation device. I'm mm. like, that is awesome. <laughs> Come here. I knew this was going to be a good idea. Yeah. But they're, yeah. I mean, you know, kids like they're just wild mm. in their, the, what they bring to things, like the freshness of their approach. Um, so, yeah, that was Aki because she's been reading um, a lot of Franny Fisher and she's like, oh, jewellery, they're always killing people with jewellery in <laughs> Franny Fisher novels. And, um, yeah, so she was just full of, yeah, full of um, suggestions, mm. <laughs> very good ideas. <laughs> and then Jack, um, who's nine, had his um, science magazine, um, which had this big spread of... Um, birthstones mm. so he just went through them all and it was like well what's that one and what's peridot you know peridot you know and um and just uh, many things that that yeah that I would never have thought of um it's kind of Melody and I were actually having a conversation um a couple of weeks ago talking about um plastic and how in the future, it's likely that plastic as a material is going to be really restricted or mm -hmm. even become something that we, you know, we're not allowed to use in the way that we use it now. And that you know, work like this in things like upcycling and reusing and um, as it becomes like, hopefully to me, a finite thing and um, the way that these kind of different objects emerge from things. Yeah, I was thinking about it with when you were talk, talking about Gia, you know, as a two-year-old now, what, what, will, what will she think of these kinds of objects in 50 years? But that's where um, my conversation with the kids went at the end because mm. then they started talking about the chopsticks with the jade lines on the end. And yeah. I was like, well, are they jewellery? And that was like, oh, you know, this was a really <laughs> big thing to think about. And then that's when Jack came out with, he went, well, I think anything that's precious can be jewellery. Mm. I went, oh, that's another, that's a good point, yes. you know. Um, so that was a, yeah, it was a great exercise. Um, and I think, yeah, generally, like, asking children to respond to art is always mm. revelatory, isn't it? Mm. It's like, God, they're so good at it. Um, but I was really interested in, in um, else your, what it brought up for you, like it kind of, this show took you into a bit of a, a narrative doorway into a new story. Yeah, I mean, idea. any way I can f find a way to write something depressing and dystopic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do it. Jewelry, end of the world. Got it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I kind of, I've, I've had that sort of anxiety a little bit about this because I was sort of like, well, I'm not, I don't make jewelry, I wear it, but how do I write about it? and why would I, kind of. Um, and so it was kind of looking at the work and, for me, finding a way in that allowed some, something to happen from looking at this work 
that opened up into my practice um, and the space that I'm that I have been working in. Um, and it was it was because of the watch where I I had this huge amount of guilt of like it costs more to fix an old watch than it did to just buy the exact same watch mm. again, which is horrible. Mm. But now I have an old this exact watch that's broken. I'm like, well, what what will happen to this object? Where does it go? Mm. That's why I love the Bureau of Suspended Objects because it's a mm. project where an artist um, uh, works in uh, like a recycling centre and almost reclaims things before they end up in landfill um, and then they sort of document them and um, it's it's kind of an art piece in itself but there's some really an interesting things around waste and recycling that have emerged from that um, yeah just I think we've got about five minutes but does anyone else want to comment on yeah yeah um, I took the prompt of um, the method, the artist's method, and and the list. So I've combined prompts. <laughs> um, string, strung, thread through, chop, chip, prong, pring, mm -hmm. pick, paint, cut, curl, crimp, sew, stuff, rat, wind, rung, wear, where slip slap slop glue goo chew draw drew spew fart <laughs> stuff stab strap squirt shine grab grip tie tag tuck drill saw sort Awesome. I'm really loving the sort of poetic responses that are happening today. Mm. There's so much poetry. Um, I don't know, I've sort of lost my train of thought on that, but just, just amazing, the listing, associating. Well, it's so interesting because what you've done is kind of very much along the same line as what you were talking about, with the words as beads almost. Mm -hmm. kind of very uh, onomatopoeic sensory words as beads. It's like, mm. yeah. Mm. There's also something there about the way that each of those beads or those words relates to the one next to it and how mm. there's a dynamic happening between textures of words yeah. um, as well as w word images that they bring up in the brain yeah. bouncing against each other. Absolutely. Yeah, I totally agree. It's, thank you. I just wanted to... Um, I don't think we've properly acknowledged your sharing. I think mm. we moved on too quickly and I just wanted to thank you for um, sharing your writing and I... For me, it really, um, it really spoke of um, the way, you know, we might talk about process and method in the making of a piece and then, you know, the object's ready and then we w finished and then we wear it and I feel like your piece really um, spoke of the, there's no beginning or ending to that object. It kind of is in the making and it's always in the making and returns to the sea and it really had a... Um, it evoked that for me, this kind of life cycle of it that wasn't about it being finished for a wearer to wear it. So I just, yeah, thank you. Mm. And, and I think that writing's like that too, right? Like the, there is the making of writing as well and the fact that it doesn't end as well. And even when we finished a piece or we published a piece, that it's still kind of alive and changeable. Mm. There's a really nice connection there between making with words and making with objects. Mm. Mm. Is that a nice thing to... Oh, yeah, one more question. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, I might just say, like, one thing to close that off because there's a thing that's jumping in my mind heavily. Um, as someone who isn't really making but about to start making jewellery, um, I think it's really important for me to understand the psychological aspect, to give it value and importance because I don't want to make another object for the world if it's not going to be you know, something that's treasured, like sustainability is important. I don't want to make a piece of junk, basically. But I think what connects everything that's sort of been talked about is the, the soul connection. So all of your pieces, which were so extraordinarily beautiful, were really unique because they were expressions of self. And I think when you come back to jewellery, the person who's making it, the maker, the artist, um, 
it, it comes from their soul. It's a man, like a physical manifestation of their soul and then there's a connection because it again goes to someone else and it becomes part of their narrative. There's interaction between the maker, the wearer, the giver, the receiver. There's a lot of sort of ties. I think of pieces that, like I've got a ring here that I've been wearing for a year and a half every day and I bought that at a specific time, location with a person at a point in my life and it has really deep meaning and I like the idea that we can never really know the true depth or soul in a piece of jewellery by looking at it because it's inherent in us, in our sort of internal understanding. It's a physical object, but it represents a lot of our soul. So I think that's a nice, like, connecting thing. It's, that's what sort of connects it. Essentially, it's the narrative. It's our sort of expression of self, but everything that comes before and after it, you know, where it's been, all of that. Yeah. Did you have uh, something you want to say? Yes, yes. yes. Yeah, please. Yeah, I was uh, doubting because I was um, thinking still a little bit stuck about the prompt one, which is very basic, like what is jewelry? Mm -hmm. And I was very interesting about your, your work of writing on recycling and what's the value of it and how do we gonna give a life? Because I've never really thought of a jeweler until a jewelry until today until now or how it can give value to uh, those objects it, that nowadays we are facing a lot of problem with sustainability and how this can give a value but then i'm wondering how can how could we as a designer i'm thinking how could we um make sure that people maybe through the writing and give them these communications, <clears throat> how can we make sure that they will give a value to everything and then maybe build jewelry out of it? But, but then, what is jewelry? Something we hang, it doesn't, it, what I wrote is, it's a precious, precious object that is not necessarily wearable, but it's also a wearable decoration. It's valuable. It reminds you of something, it's a memory. Maybe it's just a way to show off. It's diamonds for girls. I don't know. <laughs> it's many things. So I was wondering how can we, if some of you have some ideas on how could we, yeah, communicate that value to people. So maybe they will see a diamond into the old uh, clock, a watch, mm. rather than into an expensive diamond which is causing death and blood in many parts of the world. Mm. 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 I feel like um, it's maybe slightly tangential, but I, I really resonated with what you said about it is about the narrative. It's about the meaning that you bring to the object. Um, and I, I mean, I really feel like it's kind of great now that um, without it being any kind of pretentious thing, but this idea of bespoke or um, artist made and local designed and, and, you know, this kind of thing where it's, um, moving away from any kind of mass production and I think that's that's something that jewellery does amazingly that like there's so many beautiful pieces being made in Melbourne um, and often they're one of a kind um, so it it comes to you already with a bit of a story and then you kind of you build your own narrative around this object and it becomes meaningful and precious in that way um, yeah, you know, I feel kind of stupid that I've bought this kind of watch that's just off a conveyor belt with probably millions of them, um, as opposed to, you know, this ring that my sister made. So, yeah, it's, I think, maybe um, kind of this shift away from, from mass production and to more, to more kind of crafted work might be a way for that to, to happen. Which is like back to the future yeah, sort of thing. You know, I mean, back to the way that it it was. We did it yeah. once. It's not, yeah. We've got to wrap up, everyone. So thanks, thanks everyone, for coming. Thank you. Thank you.